We're going to be looking at the uh, second semester of Minor Prophets, the eighth lesson for the spring semester of 2022. And we're going now into the book of Nahum. Nahum. Nahum was written somewhere around 630 B.C. Remember the C means approximately, or circa. So somewhere around 630 B.C. Uh, meaning that it's about 18 years before uh, Assyria was defeated by the Babylonians. And that's very, very significant here. Uh, remember the book of Jonah. Jonah was written about 150 years before this book. And Jonah uh, was supposed to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, and tell them, uh, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. But through the preaching of the word, uh, the king got saved, and people got saved, and a uh, great revival broke out, and Jonah didn't get his wish, and of course Jonah pouted about it. We remember that story there. Uh, God preserved uh, Assyria because they repented. But Assyria has long been a threat to Israel. We already know what happened in 9, uh, uh, 721. Assyria went in, you remember, to the northern kingdom and took them captive. Then in 701, we looked at in the book of Micah, they set their sights on Judah and made that attempt to go in. Uh, look, the name Nahum, and it will be up on one of the screens here in a second, but the word Nahum means comforter or comfort. Uh, it's very, uh, it's basically the Hebrew word for the New Testament word Nabus, like in Barnabas. Uh, bar means what? Do you remember? Bar. Uh, like Peter one time was called Simon Bar Jonah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, Bar means son. Oh, that's all oh, son. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Remember, uh, Barnabas yeah. means son of consolation or son of comfort. Uh, so Bar, if uh, Bar Nahum would actually mean the exact same as Bar Nebus. So Nahum, Nahum, Nebus. Uh, and it was written, it's a book of comfort, uh, but the book's about the destruction of Assyria. So how is that a book of comfort? Well, it's not any comfort to Assyria, but it was comfort to Judah, to Israel, because God said that he would uh, punish them. Uh, and so the book of Nahum pronounces judgment. Now, for many years, Assyria had been a very wicked kingdom. Prior to Jonah going... Oh, look at your business. thought she was a wicked thing, though. <laughs> she said, hey, Siri. She thought, what do you call me a wicked thing for? Uh, so, uh, Nahum was written about 1,500 years before Jonah. Uh, Nahum was written about 1,500 years before Jonah. years had been very wicked. And God had constantly promised judgment upon them. But judgment comes in God's time. All right? It doesn't always come when we want it. Uh, you have somebody who's been evil against you or whatever. Sometimes we want God to judge them immediately. Uh, when the fact is, in God's time. And we don't have to see the, the judgment on people. That's not our business. We might see it. God might show it to us. But he may not. And we think, okay, this person got away with what they're doing. But we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I remember uh, some people that was doing some th horrible things, and they buy new cars and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, man, you think here, God, why aren't they? How are they getting away with this? And I don't know why they did it, but they used our fax machine at the church one time. And I walked by a fax machine. I didn't know who was using it. I looked down, and it was a foreclosure notice. 
on uh, uh, taking their car away and their house away and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, well, what in the world is this? And I realized it was these people. Uh, and so uh, I just set the facts aside, didn't say anything about it. I never said, to this day haven't said anything to anybody as to who it is. Uh, but they, the next week they act like everything's great, and I'm thinking, oh, so they're saying things are great, but deep down they're not. And that's the way it is. You know, judgment, like I say, we may not see it. People lie to you about whether God's judging. Uh, but we see judgment many times in the Bible. Um, the book of Obadiah, remember, is a judgment on Edom. Nahum is a judgment on Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, so the Assyrian judgment. The book of Zephaniah, we don't go through a whole lot, we should, but when's the last time you heard a sermon from Zephaniah? The judgment on Judah. Jeremiah, the judgment on uh, Babylon. Yeah, it shows the judgment of of Judah. Uh, in the, even the fact that God wanted Babylon to come in and conquer Judah. Uh, and then God judges Babylon for conquering Judah. Now, that doesn't sound right on the surface. You know? God caused Babylon to conquer Judah, and then God judged Babylon for conquering Judah. It doesn't sound right, except it's, more, it's deeper than that. Yes, God wanted Babylon to conquer Judah, but God did not want Babylon to be so vicious and ruthless like they were. And so God judged them for that, their harshness, not actually for judging them, but for their harshness and how they judge. Ezekiel talks about the judgment of Gog and Magog, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, that's tribulation period uh, when uh, they go against the Antichrist there in the middle. And the Bible says that uh, five, six of them, or 82%, somewhere around the 82, 83% of the population will die. And so a very, very great consequence there. And Daniel talks about the judgment of Persia, uh, about um, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, and Darius, king of the Medes, and uh, they would fall, and they did, they fall, ended up falling to Greece. Uh, which in turn fell to the Roman Empire. Name means the comfort, comforter, the comforter. The city, Capernaum in the Bible, means the village of Nahum. There's no absolute evidence. There's a few historians that will say it to be true that it was named after Nahum. Uh, there's no biblical evidence for it. Uh, but it sounds logical. I mean, it, it could be like that. We name cities after people. Uh, even the book of uh, Ecclesiastes talks about uh, naming things after people. of the book itself is the destruction of Nineveh. <clears throat> Nineveh was a world power. I mean, they were the, the strongest nation in the world for a long, long time. And so to be defeated uh, just didn't sound logical. And how, how can they end up losing? Well, the Roman Empire was even greater than they were. And they fell. It lasts a long time, but they end up falling as well. And I hate to say it, but I see America, I can see where we no longer exist as a nation. I mean, I really can, and I would never thought I would say that. You know, growing up, this is the greatest nation, and the most powerful nation. Uh, the president 
is the supreme ruler of the world almost in a sense. I mean, that's what our mentality has always been. But we see the way things are going now. We could be wiped out. I mean, there'd be nothing now for Putin to push a couple of buttons and we've got a nuclear war on our hands. Yeah. And the Bible doesn't say there won't be a nuclear war. It could happen. I remember as a kid uh, in high school uh, reading a book on uh, Hiroshima, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. The atomic bombs that dropped there. And, I mean, as a kid, I mean, that was a pretty heavy book to, to realize, you know, how many people died and all that. And most historians believe that the atomic war, the atomic bombs, actually saved more lives than were lost. Because the war, if it had kept going on like it was, because it was 25 million Russians who died in World War II, uh, uh, six million Jews in the gas chambers, and close to that number, uh, among other people, uh, uh, gypsies uh, that were wiped out during that time. Uh, I mean, at worldwide, it was devastating. As war continued longer, there'd be more and more war. So. There's somebody out there thinking, you know, let's push the button now and maybe it'll save lives in the long run. Who knows? What, what, what nationality is the Ukrainians? Are they Jews? No, they're uh, uh, just Europeans. Oh. I've never asked you that question before. They're the same thing, really, as the Russian people. Oh, okay. Uh, they were Soviet Union. The whole uh, European thing was. Uh, Ukraine. The Ukrainian language is different than the Russian language, but it's very, very similar to it's kind of like probably the difference between Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, right. uh, somebody from Portugal can <laughs> understand Spanish and get by. But they can understand Russian. Yeah, they can understand for the most part Russian. Like I said, there's some things that are different and some things that are... It's, it's basically the same alphabet, Cyrillic alphabet. Nineveh was a very well fortified city. It had 60 miles of walls around the city. hundred feet high. That's a 10-story building. The uh, town I grew up in, in West Virginia, the tallest building was seven stories. And that's a pretty tall building. I remember the National Guard had once while come out and train on repelling down it, you know, because it was the big, uh, biggest city or biggest building around. Uh, and it was been saying that doesn't mean much except for a building, but a uh, 10 story building, you wouldn't want to uh, fall out the windows in a 10 story building. Uh, you'd do really well for nine floors, but that last one would get you. <laughs> I did a tennis line. Did you? 30 flights. 30? Mm -hmm. Wow. There's three times. Where was this at? Winston Tower. Oh, okay. They used to have it for the March of Dimes. You, you did it? I did it. Oh, at the Winston Tower? Uh -huh. They used really? to do it for the March of Dimes. I guess in COVID, they hadn't yeah. done it. But yeah, yeah. it's yeah. called the Tower Climb. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. The firefighters do it in their, um, their, their workout, their breakout. You know, uh -huh. They have well, a that's heavy. Yeah. That's yeah. heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's it, was, yeah, it was fun. I would be interested. I don't know. I've, airplanes and hot air balloons, that's that, they don't bother me a bit. But standing on the edge of the building, mm -hmm. I, I might be able to do that. Well, no, just climb up the steps, the whole tower. Oh, climb, the steps. The tower. Climb, oh, oh, I thought you tower. meant. I thought you meant no, rope. No, no, no. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's easy. That's easy. How many steps is it? Just Thirty flights. Thirty, 30 flights would be a, a lot. I mean, I, if I could. Now I don't think I could do that. Mm. Um, at one time I could have, but I thought you meant repelling me. No, 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 no. That's wonderful, Jen. Yeah. That is good. Ooh, that's wonderful. But anyway, I mean, ten-story buildings is significant. Uh, and you live in days and times when uh, shoot an arrow up ten-story building, you're not going to get it. Right. right? But uh, I shoot one from the top down, yeah. Yeah. you say you have more chances. Or what they often would do was pour oil, hot oil, 
uh, off the walls and onto the people trying to get up. And what a lot of times they would do, uh, let's say this here is a building, and over time they would make an embankment against it, meaning they would basically get dirt and they'd start piling it up. And if, if it were right here, they'd start piling it up, and it may take them a couple of years. Uh, but eventually they'd get the dirt high enough to where they could uh, get up his wall. Uh, there's a place in Israel called Masada in southern Israel, north of Elot, north of the Red Sea. But it's a mountain where many of the Jews uh, in 70 AD, when they fled the persecution from the Roman general Titus, uh, they fled to that mountaintop and lived there for a couple of years. Uh, they had a uh, huge... Uh, uh, place for water, they had farmland, they owned, it's not a huge mountaintop, but uh, they basically were very well fortified and were able to survive up there until the Romans eventually did build an embankment against it, and before they got the embankment up to reach them, all the people committed suicide, got to be taken. Uh, and it's, I, I walked up that mountain, uh, and that takes a lot to walk up on the outer side of it. Now they have car, uh, trams that go over uh, chair lifts and kind of thing. Nahum predicted, he said in one uh, eight, an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place. And chapter 2, verse 6, he says the river shall be opened. So how do you get into a 60 mile wall 100 feet high? Well, you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you can't go around it. And so the Assyrians believed that there's no way in the world that they could be defeated. As the Babylonians later on would feel the same way when in their palace, when uh, the Medes and Persians actually end up taking over, uh, in a very, very simple way did they take over. Uh, but the Babylonians felt like there's nobody can defeat us. That's why they were in a drunken party. Basically, the same thing happens here. But again, it goes down to the fact that with God, anything can happen. And no matter how big the enemy is, God is still bigger. Nebuchadnezzar. This is Nebuchadnezzar's father, who was king of Babylon at the time. Attacked the Assyrians three different times. And was defeated three different times. And so what this did was led to pride by the Assyrians. They tried three times, they lost three times. We are not going to be defeated. Sometimes I like to watch videos on YouTube. Um, and they're titled, uh, uh, Cocky Boxers Who End Up Getting Defeated. <laughs> and you got these guys, you know, talking all this junk, and you know they're the greatest. Step. Well, they all think they're Ali, or and, and I mean they they were great, very strong fighters, they, you think. But they they get in there, and one of them was dancing around, acting like he was hot stuff, and he you know, kind of did a little move, dance move. The other guy hit him, knocked him out, straight flat out. I mean, he never got up again. Uh, and it, I, I like to watch those. It's kind of like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's wrong for you know, to enjoy that so much, but uh, it's funny, you know, because they get so cocky thinking that they were the greatest thing it ever was. And not. I mean, even uh, uh, Mike Tyson and uh, Buster Douglas, remember that fight? Uh, Mike Tyson thought, Buster, who? You know? <laughs> he got Buster. Yeah, he got Buster. <laughs> But that's what happens when you get cocky mm -hmm. and you feel like you're the greatest thing. You know, Edom uh, uh, felt like that in the book of Obadiah. You know, God says you, you're lift up on high and you feel like you, know, you cannot be defeated. Well, guess what? 
And so what do they do? They celebrate their victories these three times. They start to celebrate their victories with a big drunken parties. Remember what happened to the Babylonians? They were celebrating, they were getting drunk, and they called for the uh, uh, vessels from the temple to be brought in so they could uh, drink out of them. And as they're drinking, they look up at the wall and see a finger right on the wall. Many, many tekel eupharsin. Uh, the kingdom has been found weighed in the balance and wanting, and that's it. Uh, and they couldn't understand the language, so they asked somebody to interpret, and finally Daniel did. You know, if they had just waited a little bit longer, they wouldn't need a Daniel. Because the people's language it was, was the Medes and Persians. So if they had just waited, the Persians could say, oh, look, who wrote this? <laughs> Well, the Tigris River, remember the Tigris and Euphrates River, the two longest rivers there in the Middle East, uh, overflowed and ended up washing a hole in the wall for the Babylonian standard. And they couldn't do it. Now remember, going back here to this right here, what's going to happen in 1 8? An overrunning flood, he will make an utter uh, to the end of the place. Now, we may. If we didn't know what happened, we might think an overgrounding flood, that just means you know, a bunch of people went in. Rather than an actual flood? No, it was an actual flood. The river shall be open. I mean, what God said 18 years before is exactly what happened, and it ended up uh, uh, making a hole. 300 years later, uh, this is 612 B.C., Nineveh is destroyed. The capital is destroyed. And not only is Nineveh destroyed, but 300 years later, when Alexander the Great was going around conquering the world at that time, he did not realize this, nor any of his men, but they marched right over Nineveh and didn't even realize it. And Nineveh was gone. And in fact, Nobody really knew where it was until 1845, when they finally discovered it. It's always funny, these uh, so-called scientists in the world saying that the Bible's not accurate in this or not in that. And for years they said uh, that Nineveh wasn't what they said it was, or they said that the city of Jericho never existed. Uh, and then archaeologists dig up these things and find out that, yes, it did exist, and exactly where the Bible says it was at. Uh, and no archeo archaeological find discovered anywhere has ever in any way whatsoever proven the Bible wrong. Never. It's always proven the Bible to be absolutely correct. Uh, and it never will. Uh, I mean, there have been people who've uh, tried to fake uh, archaeology. There was a, not too many years ago, a, a woman president of some major university, I can't remember which one it is now, if I knew I'd tell you, uh, had a piece of uh, papyrus, uh, kind of like the writing paper of the day, and wrote on there, um, uh, something about Jesus and uh, his marriage to uh, Mary Magdalene and his children and said that they discovered it in the Middle East and found that here's Jesus married to Mary and, and all these children which proves that Jesus uh, did have a wife and, and children well first of all if they had actually found that and it actually said that well, what, what, there's only one Jesus in the world I mean, Jesus' same name is Joshua. Uh, uh, Hastings. Yeah, Hastings. How many Marys are there? You know, so that, you know, is, but the, so they dated the paper, and they found out that, well, the paper does come from the right time. The ink. Yeah. Well, even uh, the ink, they felt it was right. And so it met the standards. And then somebody was looking at it one day and realized that the writing, uh, the, the language that it was written in, 
wasn't the language, the Greek of the New Testament time, but rather a much later time. And so this woman who faked it, and later on would admit she faked it, and still kept her job and all this stuff, you know, admit she lied about it, uh, it was proven false. And God's not going to be proven wrong. He does not. None of his destruction comes. every year. Uh, even the meteors, it's a different uh, substance, but even if we're the same, uh, scientists disbelieve the universe all created at the same time. So if we're all, the universe created at the same time, then all the rocks have to be the same age. So carbon-14 dating stuff, it's just stupid. Uh, but it's just a scientific ploy to uh, deny God. God is jealous over his people. God protects us. God cares about us. He cares about our conversations. He listens in on our conversations. When we're talking about Him, He writes it down. Mm. You know, God is ever-present. He's omnipresent. And He is always with us. And He cares. Even when we don't feel like it, that He does. Is it wrong to defend Him? No, I always find myself. Always no, I, I don't think it's wrong to defend him. Especially uh, when people say stupid stuff, and I'm, I'm just uh, yeah. Well, no, no I, I think you know we need to. I, now, I, I think it's wrong to argue. I'm not yeah. Uh, I'm not because you'll never get anywhere arguing. Uh, but yes, I think we ought to make a statement of uh, uh, and take a stand for what we believe in, yeah. and even if nobody agrees with us, we still let our point be known because. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and listen to somebody blaspheme God. Uh, I've worked in places where people come and blaspheme God, and I'll tell them stop. Yeah. And one guy went to church all the time. Uh, I don't know what kind of church it was. Uh, he was, said he played in the choir, played guitar or something. He, and he played in the choir. Yeah. He played. Yeah, he played. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he was blaspheming God all the time, and I told him. And he said, no, it's not blasphemy. I said, today God's name in vain. He says it's not wrong. I said, look, it made the top ten here in Exodus 20. And he never would get it, but finally he quit blasting the gun. But yeah, it's absolutely right to take a stand. But God is jealous over his people. It says the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord your vengeance. The Lord your vengeance and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserve wrath for his enemies. So it took... God, a long time to judge Nineveh like he did. But judgment came at the right time. Uh, I'm sure that Judah and us, we want God to zap our enemies right away. Um, but we don't always know the full story. Uh, sometimes that person may have attacked you, and it's purely beneficial to you that they did. They may have helped you up far more than you even realized. And later down the road, you get to thinking, you know what? Because you know, I know in my life that's happened. I know one of the greatest attacks on me, I remember what I did when that happened. I mean, I, I started praying more. I, I actually started coming in here like at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd come and I'd walk to the parking lot and have my devotions out here. And I changed the way I had my devotions. I changed the way I was studying to make sure that it was real and not just going through the motions. And that was a great blessing to me. You know, to, to change up the way we do things every once in a while. I don't know about for you, but I can't do the exact same thing the same way every day in the day. I have to change up. You know, the time I have my devotions is different. Uh, uh, some people get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and they have devotions from 5 o'clock to 5.30, whatever it might be, uh, every day. And that's fine. If that's you, that's, me. that's, that's great. And that's great. if it works for you, that's one. That's hard for me to do that. 
uh, I know uh, I had students here, Marie was one of them, and Becky, for years, probably oh, 20 years or more that I know, every fr uh, uh, what day was it? one day of the week, it might have been Saturday, I can't remember now, I know one day a week, or maybe every day they got up uh, early in the morning and they called everybody, they, they had a conference call, oh, yeah. of, I don't know how many, six or so more people. Uh, and they prayed together and, and uh, basically had a little devotion together every single morning and did that. However often they did it. I know they did it for years and years and years. And I admire that. Mm -hmm. It'd be hard for me to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm just not that type of person. So we all have different ways of doing it. And for me, I have to change that every once in a while. I don't want to get stuck in one routine of doing it just the exact same way every time. Nothing wrong with that. Right? But, you know, you don't get caught up in the routine. Um, Remember Jesus cursed the fig trees? Mm -hmm. And early on, uh, when Peter came and Nathan and Nathaniel came, and Jesus said, I saw the end of the fig tree. Mm -hmm. Do you know why they cursed the fig trees and why he mentioned the fig tree? It's because the Jews began a habit, for whatever reason, of basically having their devotions under fig trees. And so they would go out, and that's where they would pray, and that's where they would basically just spend time with God. Perfectly fine, nothing wrong with that. But what happened was that became the standard for having your devotions. So, you know, you have to be here to be right with God, which you, know, you don't. And so the cursing of the fig tree was a cursing of vain traditions. You know, just an empty tradition of going through it, thinking that uh, you, know, you have to be in a certain place at a certain time in order to be able to speak with God. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, so nothing wrong with praying under fig tree. But if you think that's going to get you closer to God than any place else, then there's something wrong with it. Because you made the place more important than the purpose. You were supposed to say that. Wasn't it? <laughs> you really actually <laughs> were supposed to say that. You don't know. I, I heard the voice in my in, in, in the guest room, that's where I go and I pray. And I, I heard the voice and I was so overwhelmed by hearing the voice that I made a prayer closet. And I said, well if I heard the voice in the bedroom and just make this my prayer closet. And I took all my clothes out, clean, fixed the closet up and that's my prayer closet. I haven't heard the voice anymore. Mm -hmm. But I still go in the closet and I pray. And, I, and that's, that's just that place that I go yeah. to pray. And just like you just said, I don't need that place to right. pray. Yeah. I know I don't, but that's my and place, that's, that's place fine. that I go to I, every morning at 5 o'clock. I'm in there praying. For a long time, I used to go to the park and roll home. There was a certain bench I go in and sit there and pray. Mm -hmm. did it for a couple, several years, uh, usually uh, uh, a few times a week. Uh, and that was great for me. I'd sit there and pray, read my Bible, uh, uh, everything, uh, and then I, I, I switched up. But there's nothing wrong with being in the same place and having a prayer call. It's like the, the movie, the, uh, what's the prayer prayer. Prayer. War, 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 war. Yeah, war. Yeah, war. yeah, I thought it's a neat, that's exactly what you're doing, kind yes. of thing. And that's great. Uh, if that fits your personality, your requirements with God, but, uh, again, that room is not magical. Uh, nor is any other room. Uh, and when it becomes that to you, then it's it's vain worship. You know, if, if, if I'm not saying when, I'm saying if, if it, uh, that, wherever it may be. And so we, we, we do need to understand that it's not the location itself, it's, it's being with God. God punishes the enemy uh, because of pride, uh, ungodly, Alliances, worshiping idols. And you know, sometimes we think that we're not guilty because we're not prideful people. We don't worship idols. Um, it might be ungodly alliances. Maybe someone that we're not supposed to be around. Someone who tears you down. I, by myself, tend to be a very positive person, very optimistic about things. 
But when I'm around negative people, pessimistic people, I can easily become pessimistic. Uh, and I catch myself sometimes. So there's been people that I've you know, tried to build up a friendship with that for a while there I thought was going to be good and all. Then I realized, no, this is, this is hurting me. Even family members I don't go around because they, they, they hurt my relationship with God by making me a negative person and always down, down, down. So uh, pay attention to who you're around. Because the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that sells nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Pretty harsh statement there. And the bloody hands. I remember Nineveh was extremely, extremely wicked. Uh, capital of Zerah. They crushed their enemies. They didn't just defeat the other nations. Uh, they talked about one place where they built a, uh, basically a bridge out of dead bodies. And marched the troops across them. Some of the things that Hitler did were very close to what Assyria had done. Uh, they talk about Hitler taking skin off of people and making lampshades out of it. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence of that in Assyria as well. I, I don't know how people even consider such a thing. You know, uh, much less do it. Who thinks of that? Hitler was guilty of experimenting on a lot of, of people. I mean, there's all kinds of people who just suffered greatly before and during the war. Capture the goods, made slaves out of the people. We got here to talk about their sin too deep to cure. Uh, they crossed that line. Uh, Jonah had hoped they crossed that line when he went. But they hadn't, and they repented. Uh, but you remember, that's kind of what Jeremiah uh, preached in the beginning of his ministry, that Judah needed to repent. But then God basically came back and said, okay, keep preaching, but tell them no matter what, if they repent or not, they're still going to captivity. They crossed the line. All the nations around Assyria had suffered because of her cruelty as well. Let's take a break. Hey, how are you doing? Good.